Okay, good morning, everyone. Hope all of you had a good weekend and all of you are doing well. Yes. Okay, yes, can somebody lead uh, prayer, please? Can I ask uh, uh, Aradhana, can you lead us in prayer? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Father God, for this time, for this day, Lord, as you've given us, Lord. Lord, whatever we learn, Lord, help to receive in our mind, Lord. Give us a new revelation, Lord, of your word, Lord. Lord, bless each of us, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, okay. Let me just keep this the side. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, last Monday in our um, two hour class, uh, do you remember what we learned? Anyone remembers what we learned? Yeah, we learned about the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. Okay, pre-existence of Jesus Christ. That's in the first class. Thank you, Isaac. That was our first class, but I'm saying what, uh, what did we learn in our previous class? His role in creation. Okay. Then what else did we look at? The promise of his coming, chapter 4. Yes, we looked at the, the promise of his coming. We looked at some um, uh, important Old Testament prophecies which foretold the coming uh, of the Christ as the incarnate one. So when we're talking about incarnation, we're talking about God taking on human form. Okay. So today we're going to uh, look at uh, what is incarnation, going to get a um, better understanding of what is incarnation. What is incarnation? What does it mean to you? God becoming man, incarnation. What does it mean to you? Or what is your understanding? You can just tell me what you understand. Okay, God became man. Okay. When you say God became man, what do you what what is your understanding? Yes, Isaac. Yeah, divinity came as human. Okay, divinity came as a human being. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Lubega. I think this was uh, God becoming, sending his son in both man and God, basically to remove uh, a deathless sin that has been, that was brought on us by Adam and Eve. Okay, so you're saying that God became man to remove the sin that um, was brought about by Adam and Eve. Did I hear you out right? Basically, through faith, to remove the sin that was brought uh, on mankind through, uh, through Adam and Eve, uh, through faith. Through faith. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? So when, when uh, God became man, was he just fully man or he was he fully God who just came and lived here on the earth? Yes, go ahead, Lubega. He was fully man and fully God. Two okay, in one. he was he was fully God and he was fully man. Okay, so when you say that, thank you, Lubega. When you say that he was fully God and fully man, how could somebody who is fully God and fully man come here and live on the earth? What is your understanding about that? How was he fully God and how is he fully man? Anyone has any different thoughts on it? Uh, does anyone else say no? He was, 
He was God, yeah, he, but he came. He, he, he was God, but he came to act as human and he operated as human. But he had the spirit of God inside him. Okay, he was God, but he came down as man and he operated as a man, but uh, and he had the spirit of God living in him. Okay, thank you. What are your other views of others? So when Lubega said he was fully God and fully man, what do you understand by that? How many of you all say that, no, he was uh, just fully man, but he just, you know, he was not God when he lived here on the earth? Anyone's going with that thought? No one? So all of you in class uh, agree that he was 100% God, 100% man. He was fully God, fully man. Well, he not he was not he did not operate fully as God. Mm -hmm. He was God, but he operated. I think he operated as fully man because some of the qualities of God he lacked as as a human being. God was omnipresent, omnipotent, but on earth Christ was not. He was not present in all places. He has to move from one place to another. So he operated more as human, though he was God. Thank you, Isaac. Some very good, important points. Uh, yes, he was fully God, fully man, but he operated as, uh, as, as fully man. He did not have some of the nature of God of being omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. Uh, and he gave proofs about that. And also something that Isaac said was, you know, he, he had the spirit of God in him. Subhashi says when he was on earth, he was fully God and fully man. Okay, thank you. Yes, go ahead, Lubega. When we talk about a man having a spirit of God, that is us, me and you and any of my brothers or sisters. But Christ, as a being, he was 100% God when on earth, and he was 100% a human being when on, he was on earth. The spirit of God living in, in man is us, is, is us, me, you, and the, all others, not Jesus Christ. He was 100% God and 100% God. Okay, thank you. Some good thoughts in today's class. Anyone else would like to share? Okay, so we look at uh, today, we'll understand incarnation uh, about God taking on human form. Uh, we'll also look at his earthly ministry um, uh, uh, and his, you know, 38, 33 year period when he walked on this earth. So in this chapter, we'll try to gain uh, insight into the how of the incarnation. How did God take on human form? Uh, we'll, we'll gain a biblical perspective of uh, his incarnation. Uh, and we'll also look at what happened when this eternal God became a uh, man, when he became the man of Galilee. Uh, we will not look at the historical aspect of the whole thing, but we'll uh, rather look at the spiritual uh, implications. Okay, uh, So we look at how... Uh, God became man, and for that we will look at uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 and verse 14. Uh, we've kind of studied this um, uh, passage in much in detail the last few classes, both in systematic theology and um, in Christology. So uh, we'll just look at a few important things. Um, now, last class, I already mentioned about uh, uh, logos and what was the prevalent meaning of this word logos um, during the time when John was there and how he takes on this word logos uh, because it had a Jewish background to it and how he uses it to introduce Jesus not as some principle or some guiding reason um, or some intermediary between God and man, um, but how the slogos, he introduces him as God himself. Uh,
Okay. Um, so in using this title Logos by introducing Jesus when he introduces him in his uh, his uh, book, uh, 1 John chapter 1, the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word here is the word Logos in Greek, uh, translated in English, it's word. So in choosing this title, the apostle is drawing our attention to the function of Christ and the function of Christ is to reveal the Father to us. Okay, so the Word is God, uh, the Logos is God, and He's one who is speaking to man. He's the one who is revealing mankind, um, uh, revealing God to mankind. And he is uh, the Logos who became uh, God manifest. That means who manifested in the form of and revealed God to us. So the word is God manifested. Okay, that means the Logos, who is Jesus Christ, uh, came to reveal the Father, to reveal the nature, the attributes, the character, uh, who God is and what he does. Okay, so I'm not going to look at all the other details because I've already mentioned it about what is uh, the prevalent idea or the understanding of the word Logos. But here we're just going to look at why he brings out this word Logos, um, Apostle John, is basically to reveal to us the function of Christ. And what is the function of Christ is in becoming incarnate is to reveal the Father to us. It is... Um, uh, the Logos, who is, um, you know, God speaking to man. It is Logos, who is God revealing himself to man. It is this Logos, who is God manifested. Okay. Um, so the incarnation is the eternal Logos, who became flesh and who dwelt among mankind. That is what uh, we read. If you can please open, all of you can open to John chapter 1. Uh, verses 1 to 3 and also follow through to verse uh, 14, okay? So here we see that, uh, you know, he became flesh, verse 14 says, can somebody read verse 14 of John chapter 1? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Yeah, so we see that this incarnation, uh, this Logos, who is the incarnate one, uh, the or the eternal Logos, became flesh and dwelled among us mankind. Okay, the word flesh uh, is not to be taught only in terms of a human body, but uh, the, the word flesh here is to be understood as somebody who's representing the fullness of mankind, okay? Uh, the fullness of humanity. That means uh, the Logos, who is eternally God, became fully man, okay? Uh, the eternal Logos took on humanity. And we also see from verse 14 that this Logos who took on humanity, the eternal Logos who took on humanity, dwelt among mankind. Dwelt uh, literally means tabernacled, okay? And it refers to um, the tabernacle in the wilderness. And we know that the tabernacle was a very special place for the Israelites. Uh, it was where they, um, you know, met God. Uh, it was where God would come and meet with his people. God would speak to them. Uh, God would speak face to face with uh, his servant uh, Moses and they would, they would also offer sacrifices. So we see that in the wilderness, God manifested his glory among his um, people. So when we talk about the manifest glory of God, we're basically talking about who God is and what he does. Uh, we read this in Exodus chapter 40 verses 34 to 38. We see that uh, when the um, Israelites were journeying in the in the wilderness, in the desert, from Egypt to the promised land, uh, we see that, um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, God moved with his people in this tabernacle. So wherever they journeyed, wherever they moved, God moved along with his people. We read about this in First Chronicles chapter 17, verse 5. Um, and even in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9, the, the first uh, half of this verse says, in all the afflictions, he was 
afflicted. That means he went through, uh, he not only journeyed with them, he identified with them. He, you know, he was, God was very present with them. Um, so also we see in incarnation that God came to dwell with mankind he came to tabernacle uh, just like in the old testament he came and he dwelt uh, with mankind in isaiah chapter 63 verse 14 can somebody read that please isaiah chapter 63 verse 14 Uh, as the cattle which go down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So you led your people to make yourself a glorious name. Yeah, so here the word glory, um, uh, the Greek word for the word glory is the doxa. And it originally meant uh, honor, reputation, or esteem that is given to somebody, to a person. So the Greek word for this word glory means doxa. And it uh, originally meant honor, reputation, or esteem that is given to a person. Now, in the New Testament, uh, doxa is used to denote, again, honor, splendor, and uh, ma uh, majesty. Okay, so it is a manifestation of the divine splendor, the uh, divine power, the majesty of uh, God. But one thing we need to be very, very clear about is when, when God became man, when Jesus lived here on the earth, you know, uh, the glory that he manifested when he walked here on the earth was not his um, divine glory, but he manifested his sonship glory. Now, how do we know this? Um, you know, we read this uh, about this in John chapter 17 in the high priestly prayer. But in John chapter 1 verse 14, it says the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So we see that he had a glory when he was there with the Father. Uh, that was his uh, glory of being a divinity, of being God. But when God became man, when Jesus became man, he left his divine glory or his glory of being deity or of being God. And he took on the glory of the sonship. Um, glory okay and that is what also we read in uh, in john chapter 17 in the high priestly prayer of jesus he says now father i'm coming back to you give me back the glory that i had even before the creation of the world okay now um the glory as the uh, uh, as of the only begotten of the father uh, we see that Paul elaborates, sorry, uh, John elaborates on this by saying that this glory is characterized by grace and truth. Okay, so when uh, Jesus lived here on this earth, uh, he did not manifest all the eternal glory that he had. Um, because, uh, you know, the eternal glory that he has uh, is something that he lives in unapproachable light, which no man has seen or can see. So if, uh, if Jesus who became man, you know, he was fully God, fully man, if he dwelt in his uh, divine glory or the glory of uh, God, you know, that he had, then, you know, he's somebody that uh, mankind could not see or uh, will not be able to go near because he lives in unapproachable light. The glory of God is, uh, you know, in, uh, he lives in unapproachable light. That is what we read in First Timothy chapter 6, um, verse 16. And so we see that when Jesus lived here on the earth, he lived in his sonship glory. And uh, when he goes back to the Father, he gives us the sonship glory. So each one of us can manifest the sonship uh, glory. Okay, uh, was that clear? Did you all understand that? It's a very important uh, truth for you all to understand that when Jesus um, lived here on the earth, he did not live in his eternal glory in the fullest sense. He lived in his sonship glory, uh, but he, when he went back to the Father, he received back uh, the glory of being deity. And when he went back, he gave us the sonship uh, glory. Okay, so each one of us 
uh, have the sonship glory, but through which we can manifest God, who God is and what he does. And that is how we can manifest um, God through the, the fruit of the spirit, who God is, okay? And uh, through the works of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, the nine gifts of the spirit, uh, we reveal or we manifest the works of um, God. Did, is this clear? Anyone has any doubts, any questions on this? So why didn't Jesus reveal his um, glory of being a uh, deity when he lived here on this earth? Because, you know, he that is something that is, you know, he dwells in unapproachable light and no man can has seen or can see. And hence he would not be able to um, dwell with us in the fullest sense or uh, minister to us or be one among us and identify with us if he lived in the fullness of his eternal uh, glory, okay? Now, what we need to understand is that on the earth, uh, Jesus was, you know, truly God and truly man. He was fully God, fully man, 100% God, 100% um, man. Um, when he became man, it did not mean that he ceased to be what he eternally was i repeat that again when he became man or when he took on flesh or when he became flesh uh, he did it did not he did not cease to be what he eternally was that means he was eternally god so he did not cease to be um, god rather the eternal god took on the fullness of humanity that means he became spirit soul and body he was fully human he took on the fullness of humanity while he limited the manifestations of his divinity okay so we see that he was fully god fully man uh, he did not cease to be god when he became man but he took on the fullness of humanity he was fully human just like you and i uh, but also he limited himself in the manifestation of his divinity divinity now the question can arise so what are the areas where uh, he was limited uh, or uh, you know where uh, where he limited himself in the manifestation of his de divinity, uh, we'll look that look at it in a little while. Okay, uh, we'll uh, turn to Hebrews chapter one verses one to three. Please, can all of you please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter one verses one to three? It's good to have your Bibles open so that you can follow through in the Bible. And can somebody read that please for us? Hebrews chapter one verses one to three. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Uh, when he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as, his, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Thank you, John. So here we see uh, this verse tells us, these verses tell us that, you know, God in various times throughout, throughout history has spoken through various people, to the fathers, to the prophets but in the last days he's spoken through his where has he spoken through in the last days through his in the past spoken to the fathers abraham isaac jacob and all of them and through the prophets but in these uh, last days who has he spoken through his son, ma'am. Yes, thank you. So he's spoken to us through his son. He's spoken uh, to human beings through mankind, uh, to mankind through his um, son. Okay. Now we can notice two uh, other facts here with regard to the incarnation that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and Jesus is the express image of God's person. 
Okay, so if you look at um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the first part of it, in the Amplified uh, Version, the Amplified Bible, it says he is the sole expression of the glory of God, and in brackets it says the light being, L-I-G-H-T, the light being, the outraying or radiance of the divine, and he is the perfect imprint and the very image of nature okay that means god's nature in brackets is god's nature so here we see that you know he's uh, jesus is a sole expression of the glory of god there's no one like him there's no one would come um, in the sole expression of the glory of god he's the light being the outraying or the radiance of the divine and he's the perfect imprint means exact a representation the very image of god's nature uh, the same verse in the Jerusalem Bible says he's the radiant light of God's glory and the perfect copy of his nature. If you read this in the NIV uh, translation, it says the sun is a radiance of God's glory and the exact uh, representation of his being. Uh, this verse, if you read it in the Greek, in the literal Greek translation, it says, who being radiance of the glory and the representation of the reality of him. So here we see that Jesus is the brightness of God's um, glory. God's glory is uh, the manifestation of the nature and the attributes of God. It is basically the expression of who God is and what he does. I've already mentioned this to you. Uh, Jesus is also the brightness uh, uh, and he's the outshining of the nature and the character of God. Okay, So all who God is, is uh, seen or uh, it shines out in Jesus. So Jesus is the express image of God's person, which means he's a perfect and complete copy the exact a representation of God, the nature of God, and what God really is like. Okay, So in the incarnation of God becoming man, uh, that is Jesus becoming man, we have the complete revelation of the living God. Um, and we begin to know and understand who God is, what he is like, and what he does. Okay, Now we'll uh, look at what is the meaning of the image of God. If you look, uh, if you turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says he's the image of the invisible God. Okay, so who is the he here? Is Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says Christ who is the image of God. God. So the word image means an exact representation of or revelation of who the person is. So for example, you stand in front of the mirror, you know, you will see an exact representation of how you look or who you are the outside. Okay, so you might admire some other personality, uh, you might want to be like them or look like them. But when you look at yourself in the mirror, it's not who you like or who you want to be like. It's uh, uh, the image in the mirror shows the exact representation of how you look um, uh, in, your, in your outward being or in your outward form. So uh, Christ is in the incarnation is the exact representation or the exact revelation of God. Um, in the incarnation, we see that the invisible God becomes visible through uh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Now we look at the seven steps of uh, incarnation and uh, we looked at this verse, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8. I would like all of you to please turn to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Uh, we had looked at this verse, but we said we will study uh, more about this in detail in the uh, in the in the the, next, the future classes, so we're going to look at this verse in detail because this gives us a lot of in-depth understanding about the incarnation. So, can somebody read Philippians chapter two, verse six to eight, please? Zilatoli, can you read uh, Philippians two six to eight, please? Mm -hmm. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man, 
and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Okay, thank you. So here we look at a, a few steps in incarnation, basically seven of them. Uh, so we see that Christ was in the form of God. So basically from this uh, verse, we're drawing the seven steps in incarnation. Christ was in the form of God. Christ was equal with God. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bond servant. The sixth one is he came in the likeness of man. And the seventh one was he, he was found in the appearance of man. Okay, so let's uh, study each one of this uh, uh, in a little more uh, detail. The first one is that Christ was in the form of God. Okay, if you look at it in the literal Greek translation, it reads who substing, sub is existing in the form of God. Okay, he was somebody who sub existed in the form of God. Now, this word form uh, is, if you look at it in this verse, there are um, two words that ap appear here, form. It says form of God and form of bond servant. Okay, so both are the same words, uh, the form of God or the form of uh, the bond servant, a form of a bond servant. These two phrases, the word form is the same, but it needs to be distinguished from uh, the words likeness and appearance that also is seen in this verse, okay, um, uh, or is seen in the same passage. Now, the word form is used, it's not used to denote something that is just outward or external, okay? So when we think about the word form, we think about something that is um, outward or external. But here it basically refers to the very being uh, or the uh, attributes of God, the very essential nature of God. And of course, the, the nature, the attributes, the very being of God is something that is worn or can be seen outwardly. Okay, uh, so Christ existed as God. Okay, and he possessed all the beings that pertains to the divine nature. Okay, so he was a form of God, which means he had, he was the very being, he had the attributes, he had the nature that pertains to the divine uh, nature of God, which, um, you know, which can, would, which was seen outwardly as well. Okay, so that is the meaning of Christ was in the form of God. The next phrase was Christ, uh, the next phrase is Christ was equal with God. Uh, we already explained how um, Jesus Christ was co-equal with um, and one with God the Father and uh, God the Holy Spirit. We already looked at it in the previous chapter, so we won't be going through that. We'll move on to the third phrase. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. If you look at it in the literal Greek translation, it means that he did it did not deem on him or, or, or it did not deem being on equality with God as something to grasp. Okay, I read that again, did not deem being on equality with God as something to grasp or something to hold on to. So we see that even though Jesus was uh, co-equal with God uh, and has the right to be honored and worshipped as God because he is God himself, but he did not hold on to that glorious estate and heavenly privilege. Okay, he gave up that. Uh, so one of the things that he gave up uh, of uh, of his eternal uh, nature or his being God or his being uh, divine was he did not hold on to the glorious estate and the heavenly privilege of being uh, honored or being worshipped as um, God, okay? Though he was, he's co-equal with God the Father and God the Son, okay? The next one, next phrase is, he made himself of no reputation. Now, uh, the Greek translation says, but emptied himself, okay? Um, now, when we say that Jesus emptied himself, um, 
it indicates that he voluntarily you know came down from one's rank or dignity uh, he descended from uh, took a descent from one's rank or dignity he came down from being god to becoming man uh, he emptied himself when we talk about emptied himself he does, does not mean that he gave up everything of him being god you know of his eternal nature uh, or in the sense of him uh, laying aside his, his essential nature as deity but he rather uh, willingly you know refrained uh, or exercised refrained uh, uh, in you know giving up or refrained from using some of his divine attributes and the divine attributes that he refrained from using were uh, being omnipotent what is the meaning of omnipotent what's the meaning of omnipotent we studied this all powerful all pop thank you all powerful omnipotent omniscient knows everything knows everything sees everything thank you omnipresent present everywhere thank you is present everywhere so you don't have to worry about these uh, phrase uh, terms or these words they're very simple omni is all uh, you know omnipotent is uh, or omnipotence po powerful okay so is all powerful omniscient sees he sees everything he knows everything and of course omnipresent he is uh, present everywhere so he laid aside his position of being equal with god uh, gave up that um, uh, you know the glorious estate and the heavenly privilege of being worshiped or being honored as god he gave up that position of being equal with god and also he willingly refrained from exercising his divine attributes and what are the divine attributes that he um, refrained from exercising was being omnipotent omniscient and omni present okay so these are the areas where he limited himself or you know he willingly uh, gave himself up uh, even though he was fully god he gave himself up the rights of being uh, co-equal with god and hence to be honored and worshiped as god i'm repeating this again so that you know all of you will um, will know this um, this these truths okay so he did not hold on to his glorious estate and his heavenly privileges of being worshiped and being honored as god he also laid aside his position of being equal with god and he willingly refrained from exercising uh, the expression of his divine attributes and that is being omnipotent omniscient and omni present okay and we see as i mentioned you know in john chapter 17 when um, when jesus was almost done with his earthly ministry was it's called the high priestly prayer of jesus uh, in uh, in john chapter 17 was 5 he says uh, and now o father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which i had before the world was okay so we see that there jesus had a glory a uh, prior to his incarnation that was of him being god uh, but when jesus was um, walked on this earth he was all god and all man but he made a choice for you and me to lay aside his uh, power and the glory of his deity and he submitted himself willingly submitted himself to the um, father okay and um, and jesus said this in uh, john chapter 14 was 28 towards the end of his uh, life here on the earth he said if you love me you would rejoice because i said i'm going to the father for my father is greater than i so here we see that um, somebody asked this question you know why did um, um why are why when when god is uh, when jesus uh, god the father god the son and god the holy spirit co equal then why does he say that you know um uh, my father is greater than i because he gave up his uh, heavenly privileges his position of being equal with god um and he, hence he says here only in terms of uh, his incarnation he says that the father is greater than i okay because he took on the position of uh, being man and not being co equal with god 
He took on the position of being equal with man and not being co-equal with God. And that's why he mentions here that, uh, you know, my father is greater than I. And it has to be understood only in the context of uh, incarnation. Okay. Um, so we see that there's a sense of joy that uh, Jesus was experiencing uh, when uh, he was returning to the father because of uh, the glory that he would receive back, the glory of being uh, God. Okay. Um, thanks, Joy. Uh, I'm not following the PDF version, so hence I'm not able to tell you the right um, page we are on. Uh, sorry. Uh, and I have a lot of extra notes in, so, you know, uh, the page numbering for me will be quite different from yours. But thank you, Joy, for helping. Yeah. Uh, so we look at uh, the next phrase. He took on the form of a bond servant. Okay, so we see that Jesus left his position of being equal with God. Um, and he took on or assumed the state of being a servant. Uh, so we see that Jesus is called the servant of God. And we have servant songs uh, that are mentioned in Isaiah. Uh, several servant songs that are mentioned by Isaiah, which is prophesying about the coming Messiah who will be the servant. Okay. Uh, and we see Jesus being a servant, taking on the position of a servant. You know, he does this willingly. And uh, he submits uh, to the uh, to the father. So he's willingly offering his um, obedience, devotion, and service. Um, and he's subjecting his uh, obedience. He's subjecting his will to that of his uh, father. And we see that, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, you know, um, take this cup away from me, but yet not my will be done, but uh, uh, yet not my will, but your will be done. So we see that Jesus submits to the will of the Father. And as a servant, he's willingly offering himself, uh, you know, uh, his obedience, his devotion, his service, and also subjecting his will to the will of the Father in doing what the Father has uh, commissioned him to do, purposed him uh, for him to do. Okay. If you look at Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 7, um, can somebody read that, please? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written on me, of me, to do your will, O God. Thank you. Jesus so here. Sorry, go ahead. Jesus came to do the Father's will. Yeah. Uh, so we see that, you know, um, uh, it is written that, you know, I've come to do the will of. God. So Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Uh, in John chapter 5, verse 30, we see that, uh, you know, it, we read there again that Jesus came to do the Father's um, will. Okay. So any questions on these uh, few phrases? We are basically looking at uh, the seven steps of incarnation and trying to get a, a deeper understanding of how uh, Jesus was fully God and fully man. And um, as uh, being fully God, what were the privileges um, that he, or what were the things that he did not, um, uh, you know, take upon himself or what did he give up as uh, being fully God and, uh, you know, being fully man? Okay. So uh, any questions? Anything? You all have any doubts? If not, we'll move on to the next phrase. He came in the likeness of men. Um, you know, uh, if you read this in the, in the New International Version, it says being made in human likeness. Okay, so we see that Jesus Christ conformed himself to the likeness of uh, human beings, just being like you and I, and he continued to live his life here on the earth till he died, uh, as all men do. Okay, so we see that he was fully human um, uh, in all aspects, uh, and we see that he uh, had the frailties of human being. Uh, he subjected himself, submitted himself to the limitations of human experience. Um, so we see in the incarnation that God or deity, um, you know, uh, becoming like man, it took on the limitations, the frailties, um, and became fully man. Okay, now we look at uh, how he was fully man in the next chapter, but in this chapter, which is basically looking at his uh, incarnation. The next phrase is that, um, and the last phrase of the steps of incarnation that we are um, studying in Philippians chapter um, 
two is that God manifested himself, sorry, he was found in the appearance as a man, okay? So uh, he appeared as a man so that we human beings could uh, see God, could understand the full revelation of God, who God is, what he does. Um, so uh, we know that um, as we read before, I know the verse, we said that, you know, no man can see God because he lives in unapproachable light. No human eye has ever seen or can see the glory of God because he lives in unapproachable light. Okay. Uh, but we see that when God became man, he was able to come down to this earth, become one like us, and we were able to see him. We were able to uh, understand the nature of God. We are able to uh, see God's ways, his works, uh, and get a better revelation of who God is. Okay. Uh, so when Jesus lived here on this earth, you know, when he spoke to people, the way he lived, you know, people could see him, touch him. Him, uh, and um, you know, walk along with him, uh, receive from him. He came to do all of this so that we could understand the very heart, the very nature uh, uh, of God the uh, Father. And uh, all this was possible only through the incarnation. Okay, we know if you read in the Old Testament, we gathered an understanding that uh, the people in the Old Testament were very afraid of God. Um, you know, they wouldn't even want to go near the mountain, uh, Mount Sinai, where Jesus, uh, where God came uh, to, me, uh, to speak to his people, give the laws, the commandments. Uh, people were really scared of God. They go through mediators like prophets and priests. Um, and this whole concept was uh, of God was that he's an angry God or maybe a God who punishes, a God who does not... Um, you know, uh, forgive uh, easily, uh, keeps a record of sin. So that was a kind of understanding and a more of, uh, you know, ritual based and law based. But here we see that, um, you know, even though God in the Old Testament manifested himself and revealed himself as a compassionate, caring, loving uh, God, a God who forgives sins, uh, but people had a, a very different uh, understanding of God. So we see through the incarnation, when Jesus came, when he did not condemn people, when he forgave sins, or when he showed a love, when he healed, uh, when he delivered people, you know, people were able to see the very compassionate, uh, forgiving, um, loving um, uh, nature and caring nature of God the Father. And all of this was possible only through the uh, incarnation. Okay, so we looked at the seven steps of incarnation in Philippians chapter two, very important verse uh, to, to know, to study, and also to understand what it uh, uh, incarnation really means. Okay, we'll take a break now and we'll come back and um, we'll um, continue with class. In the meantime, if you just want to look at it again and you have any questions or doubts, please feel free to ask. Okay, so enjoy your break. I'll see you in um, eight minutes. Sorry, I took extra time. Thank you. <laughs> 